All right, so we've looked at different uh, screens of this, uh, of these store settings. Uh, we're working backwards a bit, and so we've also got taxes, shipping, and payments to look at. Uh, but let's actually jump over to taxes. Let's go to this taxes screen. You have to decide how you're going to set this up. Are you going to even charge tax or not? Now in the good old days of internet commerce, which was just a few years ago, there wasn't really any regulation on it, so you didn't have to charge uh, tax, or you weren't charged tax. Uh, I remember a few years ago, I don't remember how long it was, how long ago it was, but Amazon started to charge tax. And then of course the internet wept. But uh, now, um, <laughs> It's a common practice because we see tax in real life, and so they think, well, uh, that's a source of revenue, and then uh, that can help uh, pay for things, in theory. So taxes, um, right now, by default, taxes are not on. So you have to decide how you're going to set this up. Yes? I thought um, if you were to purchase in different, like out of state, like if I live in California and I purchase on the internet from California, I to charge tax. If I purchase from a different state, yeah, again, uh, that's going to depend on your own particular setup and needs, but uh, we will set this up here in a moment with the tax bans. But that is true in that um, you'll have to consult with your particular um, tax representative or CPA or whatever, but uh, this also, all of this hinges upon how much do you want to set this up in terms of uh, are you going to um, also um, this is charging taxes but then that needs to lead into how you do your taxes during tax time and are you set up as a as a full business with a business license and all of that uh, it's not necessary but for example, if we do turn on taxes, we will be uh, we will then have the option to select under product prices. Products are tax exclusive or products are tax inclusive, meaning that during checkout the total price doesn't increase, but tax is shown as a line item or the tax to the price tax is added at during checkout. So let's say your product costs three ninety nine. Now, does that include the tax or not? most of the time it doesn't. With most shops that you're looking at, it's the price of the item plus shipping and handling plus taxes, etc. That's why the first item is selected. Tax is exclusive. It's excluded. Tax, the, the value of the tax is excluded. It's not part of the original price. That's usually how you'll have it set up if you turn on tax. Product specific tax. The default also is good. Replace tax percentage with product specific tax rate. Um, so the, then we've also got add per product tax to tax percentage if product has a specific tax rate. So uh, this is just going to be more fine tuned control. The defaults are good. Um, and this is why I'm getting to this and the other two screens a little bit toward the end because they are the more complex ones that really my best answer really applies to my particular client's needs. For example, your best answer applies to what you're selling, to your particular business needs and business setup. So I can give advice on an ind individual basis, but in general I would say if you're not quite sure, leave the defaults and you'll often get the best result but I'm not a tax preparation person. I, I can't give you that kind of advice. You really need to speak with a professional. From yes. your experience, have you found that this in California we have the tax underline? Well, the honestly... item that whether they're in whatever state, if it's coming from California, it has to be taxed. Well, I've been dealing with clients that are based in California, and so yes, that has been that answer. And then so I sometimes people come into this class that they have their business fully set up and they are a Delaware Limited Liability Corporation, for example. So that has its own extra. Okay. Yeah. For, so. for the general for tax for California, it would be just apply everything. Yes, but notice also here these are op these are op options here. 
apply tax when billing region is the same as tax rate, apply tax when shipping region is the same. So I'm in California, my store, my client is in California. So then here I'm charging them because they're in California. Um, let's say I need to bill tax to everyone throughout the US. Apply tax when billing and shipping region is the same or apply tax to billing address, apply tax to shipping address. So regardless, this is your tax logic here. Uh, again, you need to decide on your particular needs. If you're a California company and you're shipping throughout the throughout the um, the US, you have to decide what works best for you. You may decide this is way too complicated. I'm not even going to charge tax. That's fine. You just have to deal with it when it comes to tax time. You'll have to deduct those taxes at that time. And um, that may or may not work well for you. So tax rates. Now, I, we can't change anything here now. Don't do this, but let's say I'm going to turn tax on and then save it. If you do decide to use tax, then you'll get these tax rates. Uh, so we can say, okay, market. All markets or specifically targeted to specific places. So let's say I, I've turned that on and I've gone to USA. And then I can say, okay, well, every market in the US will be charged 8%. I can also tax the shipping. This is not either or. It's also taxing the shipping, which is double tax. I don't recommend that. Uh, let's say we're only shipping to California, so we can select California, and then California is, I don't know, 8.1. Let's say it's not, but you can change this tax as fine-grained as you want, because then I can add another rule here and say, okay, another USA this time shipping to Colorado, and then there it's 9%. So now this is going to be based on your tax logic. Apply tax when billing region is the same as the tax rate. So this is going to apply to California and Colorado and, uh, and, and charge them those values as appropriate. That's why I'm saying this could be complicated. This is applying to all particular regions. And is, if, you, if you didn't know, in California, at least, we have different taxes per, per uh, cities. Yeah. So I live in Chula Vista, 8%. You go two miles north to National City, and they're 9%. So if you're going to get that fine-tuned, we've got tax bans. Tax bans are special tax rules you can create and apply on a per-product basis. So these tax rates up here, based on your tax logic and other factors, are being applied to the whole store, every product. But let's say... You know, down here I have National City. And then I can set this to their 9% rate. And later on, when I, when I edit a product, this is where I apply it to the product. Please visit the product page to apply your tax ban. So now only for that one product being shipped to National City, 9%. So I could say throughout the US, 8%, National City, 9%. So for us, for this class, I'm going to leave it off until I talk to a professional to figure out what I want to do and it can be a little tricky. That's why it's off by default. For the clients that I've dealt with just on a, a real-world basis, uh, we have turned on tax, the defaults worked, and we set 
that'll obviously be under taxation for some places and over taxation for other places. But then it's all dealt with during you know, April 14th. <coughs> On another note of complexity, let's look at shipping. This is set to on. Enable shipping settings. If you're only selling digital downloads, you should turn this off. That's true. You're not going to ship any MP3s through the mail, so you might want to turn that off. Shipping origin city and shipping origin zip code. Uh, so this is going to help give the customer more accurate shipping information. So uh, let's just say San Diego. Nine. What's a, what's a good San Diego zip code? Uh, 92104. So let's say there's San Diego. Then we've got Shipwire, which is not free, but this is uh, e-commerce fulfillment warehouses. This is uh, a place where it, instead of you holding your product in your garage until you ship it, and you've got 5,000 of them, you can create a Shipwire account and they basically are warehouse storage where they will ship from their warehouses with of course discounted rates but the buy-in prices for that are something you have to decide that is worth it for you for larger clients of course this is great for most of us this is way too expensive we'll just continue to ship by taking our stuff to the post office but the great thing now is that because the post office is trying to be very competitive compared to FedEx and UPS and DLH and all of them, they're actually, if you haven't looked at them recently, the post office has really gotten a lot better. You can schedule pickups right from your front door. From the website, you create an account and you shut up, you set up a, a pickup date and the, the post, uh, the letter carrier will pick it up uh, from your home and, and process it. And you can, if you're shipping a bunch of things at once, you can set up a time, they'll come, they'll take a little detour, they'll pick your items up at the time you tell them. You never even have to open the door and say hi, they just pick it up, they take it, and then they ship it throughout the U.S. So, um, that is useful. Do you want to give any discounts? Well, let's say orders that are equal to or more than $60 receive free shipping. That's an incentive, that works. These are these little marketing tricks. Uh, if, uh, if a price is, you know, if something costs a thousand dollars, that's expensive. But if something's nine hundred dollars, that's not so expensive. And then if you have some shipping, well, I'm already buying. If you kind of know your demographics, that on average, you through your analytics figure out that people most of the time spend about twelve dollars on my site. I could entice them. Twenty dollars free shipping. You know, it's so close to getting that free shipping. Maybe I'll just buy one more thing, and it comes out to $22. So they bought $10 more than they would have normally bought, and uh, you sold a little bit more. I'm not going to turn this on for the moment, but that free shipping is pretty useful. So then uh, we can have, these are the different types of, of ways to ship. Um, let me skip the shipping modules for the moment and come down to external shipping calculators. Um, this is, well, are we shipping via USPS, so the US, United States Postal Service, or UPS, which is the corporation. So let's say we're going to activate USPS and then click Save Changes that will now give people the ability to use USPS right on your site to to calculate the the shipping. So let's try that one. USPS. We have a few options here which are all optional. The defaults will work, but if you create an account, you'll get a USPS ID. The point of that is then it will track all of that data for you so that you, then you will see where your stuff gets shipped out, have it all in a nice control panel, and from what I understand, you will also, the more you use it, the more discounts you get. 
So again, the, the post office is trying to be very competitive. Some extra shipping settings here, test server, advanced rates. You know, I see they have just UPS, and how come they don't have FedEx? That's part of the gold cart. So if you want extra shipping features, they're over there. Which, can you list both of them? Like UPS and so they yeah. can decide what they want. They can decide, exactly. And so what kind of USPS shipping? We'll say, okay, let people choose first class, the expensive one, or the standard post. Most of the time you'll be second sending packages, so packages is what I will leave. And it's going to be a parcel, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to update that. And then I'm going to save. So now you'll see that the um, you'll see that the USPS is set up, and now a person will be able to buy their product, and it'll be sent through the post office. Under the USPS settings, did you add anything? Did you click anything? Or you? Yeah, I turned on first class and standard first. Then we've also got these more complex methods. This is going to be based on a variety of factors. The one we've activated of USPS. It's going to be based on the factors basically of distance. So if I'm in California and someone buys something in Rhode Island, it's going to be more expensive than someone buying something in Oregon. So the USPS or UPS or Australian Post will figure that out here. But let's say you also want to do under flat rate or weight rate. Maybe you are shipping your, your, your handmade clay pottery, and some of it is more, uh, weighs more than others, so therefore it costs more to ship. Distance won't cut it. So you can activate weight rate and set up your rules and your logic there, and then it will um, charge people based on a weight. That, of course, requires a bunch of setup because what if something cost, what if something weighs more than five pounds at least? Well, that'll be an extra two dollars. Well, if it weighs ten pounds, that'll be an extra twelve dollars. I don't know. You have to set that up yourself under weight rate. That's out of our scope, so I won't do anything there. We have flat rate. That's another way to do this. Uh, so notice, okay, it doesn't matter if I'm shipping from California to Rhode Island as long as it's in the 48 continental United States, conti contiguous United States, everyone's the same rate even if they're down the street. So for some that will be perhaps a little pricey, <coughs> but for others it'll be great because it'll be much more affordable. All 50 states, that includes Alaska and Hawaii. You can ship internationally here and put in some values. Notice it says to offer free shipping to a region, enter zero. And then the table rate also then has to do with different uh, uh, logic uh, factors of a value of something. So notice if something uh, costs a particular item and above, then shipping is a certain price. So if you're selling things that are only two dollars and then you're adding another five dollars just for shipping, that might be overkill. So if something is, is at least three dollars or more, then you'll add some shipping to it. So again, this is another complex one. Depending on what you need, you will select the best option here. Um, this uh, so for three of the clients that I can think of off the top of my head, one of them doesn't use shipping at all because it's that that restaurant that I've mentioned before. It's stuff in the store. Two that do ship out through the U.S. Well, one of them sells jewelry. That stuff is not too heavy, so um, that one has a has the UPS uh, method, which is based on distance. And then another one. 
that I deal with, uh, she's got stuffed animals and such, uh, and on that she wanted a flat rate because she wanted to make it the most affordable for people. So any solution that works for you will be the best one, but again, you have to decide what is the best solution for you. If you need any guidance during the break, maybe we can talk about your particular needs. But shipping is another one that's a bit complicated. Once you've set it up, it will, uh, it will work out. Last item is payments. Last and probably most important, how are you going to get paid? The default right now is activated. It says test gateway. This will allow a person or you as the developer of the site to kind of go through the whole process and test it, but nothing really will exactly work. So technically at the moment, if we had products and someone clicks buy now, they would see something. Let's look at settings of test gateway. It would say manual payment. Just for the moment, I'm going to make this say test payment. Warning, no products will be sold. So if you're testing your site, but it's live, remember WordPress is automatically live. Uh, and you don't have your payment method properly set up yet, a person could technically still buy your product even if there's no payment method. So here I'm making it obvious. This is a test payment warning. No products will be sold. Click the update button. And the one, the one we'll be using for real, notice you can have more than one of these payment methods active. And notice they're all skewing toward PayPal. As I said, PayPal's been around 20 years. They're a very successful, profitable company. Uh, the best security. They have pros and cons, of course, but they've been around a while. You don't need, a person doesn't need a PayPal account to buy anything from you. They'll still just plug in their plain old credit card or debit card. It's just that PayPal will be the one handling the transaction and the security. If maybe you want a different one like Authorize.net or Stripe or some other company, well it's part of the gold cart. For the clients that I've got at the moment, it's all through PayPal. Now the downside is, and, and I have been saying throughout the course, especially last week, that one of the reasons you might want to do this yourself rather than going through Etsy or Amazon or whatever is that you take most of the profit because you're setting your prices and such. The only one, however, where that is not true and it's always going to be the case is when it comes to the actual money. There's always a middleman when it comes to money unless you're buying stuff one-on-one -on -one with cash. If you are buying anything with a credit card or debit card, there's a middleman that processes that transaction from your bank to the seller's bank. So in the middle, they take the money that you're claiming to pay, they vouch for it at your bank, transfer it over to the seller, say that it's all good, and then the transaction proceeds. So there's always that middleman and there's always going to be some fee. So with PayPal, there's a fee. With Stripe, there's a fee. With Authorize.net, there's a fee. Some of them are pretty expensive. Some of them not so expensive. But there's always a fee. So it seems that the PayPal one is about 2.9 or so. And so that's a small price to pay for having a fully set up payment method. Others are more expensive. What's the difference between the four PayPal's? That's what, that's what I'm getting to. Oh, so the PayPal Pro uh, could have a lower per transaction fee, but you're paying to use that type of account. And I don't know the price at the moment. Then we've got the, the one for digital goods, and then 
check out 2.0 and standard. So again, it's going to be different price structures mostly and other such features. We're going to focus on the payment standard. So open the settings for payment for PayPal payments standard 2.0. This is also one of the easiest ones to set up because all it needs is your PayPal email address. So uh, I'm going to provide you with a, with a video, a pre-recorded video, of the process of creating a PayPal account from beginning to end. The end result of that will be an email address that is able to collect payments through PayPal. Then we just add that address there, click Save, and that's it. It just needs a little bit of setup in PayPal. Let me ask, how many of you have a PayPal account right now? So a lot of you. Now there is personal and there is business. Technically either should work, but business gives you more features because then you have you know more fraud protection and concierge service and such, and it's also free. There's the there's there's personal and business and they're free, and then there's the pro one. The pro one is the one that costs to use, to, to have set up. So I'll provide you that, I'll provide you that link uh, to that setup in just a moment because most of us already have it. If you don't, I would say watch the video first and then I'll help you if you need it because it's not that complica complicated. PayPal wants this to be as easy as possible for you to set it up and start making money so that they make money. Right? They take their 2.9 or 2. Point whatever. And when when you're making these sales and such, and you're seeing your money add up there, it's it's a nice feeling. So I have like uh, on the side this little uh, t-shirt business also with some you know witty technical tech slogans or whatever. And uh, just recently I, I got an email that says, Oh, another $28 has been transferred to your PayPal account. So I'm selling something on this. Actually, I'm doing it via this this kind of all-in-one store called Redbubble, but it's very limited. It's not for most products. It's really just for, you know, kind of artsy products. If you want to look it up, redbubble.com. They take, of course, proceeds of your sale. And that's fine. Let's say I sell the shirt for $20 and I get $12 out of it, plus the PayPal. Well, it's not, it's not so bad because I don't have to make these shirts. I just make the logo in Photoshop, upload it, and there's my shirt. Um, Redbubble makes a shirt? Or? Yeah, they print it, they, they silk screen it, they ship it, they, all of that. They let you choose, the, the customer lets the customer choose like a rainbow of colors, so if I want a white shirt with my logo, great. I don't have to deal with the creation of it or anything, or even shipping or anything. That's where they take their cut of it. So let's see your shirt. I forget the name of my address, but let me look myself up. Because this is one of those Oh, here it is. One of these uh, passive, um, one of these passive uh, income types of things. Uh, so this is, this is one, one of my shirts here. It's just a. This is I'm a walking web page. So it's just some HTML code in various stylish colors, and you have a little <coughs> bit of HTML code. It's hard to see on the projector, but it's classic uh, green text on a black background. So when you ran the shirt. Well it's just gonna say uh, title I'm a walking t-shirt and then the body I forget exactly what it says but probably just hello world <laughs> and so then okay I like it but actually I like it in purple so that's it person chooses it there we go purple add to cart they deal with everything shipping with printing and shipping and everything and then I just watch my PayPal account grow larger couple hundred so I need to add more items but like you know these are these are stickers right here the these are just little HTML stickers so you can put you know these HTML stickers all over the place and vandalize stuff so it's also three dollars <laughs> For some reason, this has been the most popular one. <laughs> no, not yet. There is small, so maybe that might fit.
So with our store, we're, we're, we're our own store, we're dealing with our own shipping, our own handling, our own you know, processing and everything, but we can get more of the profits if we manage everything properly. But there will be some, uh, some cut from the middleman, which is PayPal, once we've set up the payment method. So you just need to include here your email account, and all these other settings are fine. You don't really need to set any of this unless something goes wrong. And I've used this plugin several times, and the defaults will just work. Uh, the the trade-off, of course, is your uh, uh, customers on your store. They fill in your shipping information and all of that, and then at the bottom it says, "Pay with PayPal." So then it jumps over to a PayPal screen. They fill that out, complete, takes them back to your site. If you don't want that break in in workflow, that a person always stays on your site because they're going to see it's a PayPal processing screen. And you can customize it a bit, but it will not look like your store. If you want it to look like your store at all points, that's when you use something more like PayPal Pro or the PayPal Express Checkout. But this one does require more setup with your API and your password and that signature, and that's a bit complicated. <coughs> but then that does keep everything on your own site, but so does the credit card processing. And that's when you definitely want the SSL for your site. So for our purposes, the standard will work. You just plug in your PayPal email address. I don't doubt that's a real email address. And then that will be enough for the person to buy your, your item. The text, one thing that I would change perhaps is, this is the text that appears when people are making a purchase. It'll say, PayPal Payment Standard. That's okay, but maybe we can just say, Pay via PayPal. Let's go ahead and save that. Where did you save that? Explain me. Well, you have to look at the settings of your PayPal oh, standard team. Okay. Remember to update. So is the standard one take credit card also? Yes, definitely. The standard one will take PayPal, uh, debit cards, credit cards, and PayPal. So if someone has you know, their PayPal account set up, they can do it that way too. When you do that, remember to also then turn on that payment option, because the only one that is technically on is the test gateway. I'm going to turn off the test gateway and turn on PayPal Standard 2.0 and save that. Well, that's going to be your PayPal email address. Right, so those are all of the settings. Those are the basic things about our store that we should set up. Once they're set up, we don't have to deal with them that much. But once, once you take some time to, to actually set that up, then you'll be able to add products and then actually start selling. So any general questions on any of the screens we saw in this general in this store settings? Okay, I think the next thing we'll do then is we'll start to uh, add some products. We don't have any products yet. 
So we'll, we'll add some fictional products. Remember, if you're follow, if you're using my site, this is Victor's Bakery. So that way we'll have to think about some other things also, like organization. So then let's pause for a moment. I'm going to make some notes here just for you to, to think about something. Okay, so let's say this is Victor's Bakery, and I'm going to be selling um, some large concept items. I'm going to be selling cakes, cookies, and pies. Obviously, I'm selling more than that, but let's say these are some of my ideas. I'm selling cakes, cookies, and pies. So under cakes, I have an idea that we have a uh, that we sell birthday cakes. We sell wedding cakes, chocolate cake, that's good. Cookies, same sort of thing. Um, chocolate chip, sugar cookies, and under pies we've got key lime pie and pecan pie. Now, under cookies, chocolate chips, I'm thinking of selling them in groups of 3, 6, 12, and 24. And same thing with sugar cookies. So notice I don't sell individual cookies, I sell them in groups of at least 3. 3, 6, 12, 24. Of course, a person can buy 100 cookies. Um, I could deal with that as well. And so we've got cakes. And then I'm also going to see under pies, well, I sell the 6-inch uh, the six uh, six, six pie, and I also sell the 12-inch. So these first items here are my categories. Cakes, cookies, and pies. Those are categories. And then the particular product, item, birthday, wedding, chocolate. Then here I've got chocolate chip cookies in these different groups. These are variations. So these thirteen. The baker's dozen. But thirteen's a bad luck number. I want people to have good luck when they eat my cookies. The thirteenth one will be the angel's share. There you go. So, um, categories, variations, and then each one is, you could then further label this, uh, you know, individual product. So all of these are, you know, individual products. Even these down here. A pecan pie is a product, but it has variations. Sugar cookie is a product, but it has variations. Um, notice, let's say, uh, okay, let me do one more pie down here. Let's say this is the uh, chocolate mousse pie. Notice in all three of those categories, I have something that is chocolate. And so if a person is specifically looking for pies, they would see those pies. Or those cookies, they would see those cookies. But what if a person just says, give me anything chocolate? 
that could include cookie pie or cake. So then those that share that commonality, those would be known as a tag. So chocolate cake, chocolate chip cookie, chocolate mousse pie. Those are all a tag. So the, the, these are the concepts um, that we will then apply into WP, WP Commerce. We will create the categories. It's best that we create categories with a little bit of planning. We can create or delete categories at any point, even while we're creating a product. But it might be a good idea to create our categories early on. Tags, I often find, we create after we start to populate the store, because then we figure out, okay, these are kind of related. So it's good to tag them. And then, of course, variations. They can be added or removed at any point, but if you kind of already have a plan, variations can be created pretty easily. So this is what we're going to do in WP Commerce in a moment. Does this make sense? If you were like selling t-shirts, when you go for like instead of your cake cookies, whatever, your t-shirt, then it would be size would be one, and then color, and where's that? It could be almost any way you want. Let's back up. Are there, are there going to be men's versions of t-shirts and women's versions? Those usually have a different cut. So maybe the categories would be men's shirts, women's shirts. And then the particular products will be, okay, long sleeve shirt, that's the next one, the individual product. And then long sleeve shirt, small, medium, large. Then we could have, you know, V-neck. That's the individual product, small, medium, or large. That's the variation. And then where would you add color? Color could be another variation. You can add more than one variation to a thing. It could be small, medium, and large, as well as color. So red shirt, long sleeved, men's or red shirt, long sleeve women's. So most uh, types of products can be divisible within these three, within these four ideas. Categories, tags, individual products, variations. What's also useful about thinking this way is, uh, as I said, the the default for this plugin is that it will put um, it will put all your products on one page, the products page. But I want a page just of cakes, just of pies, and just of cookies. And so, when we use categories specifically and also tags, we can then do that. We can have the shop link and display whatever we want and then we can have a shop with a drop down button and the drop down includes cakes cookies and pies and that way a person can go directly just to look at pies and only pies show up that's going to be our goal um, does that make sense the tag often is best to use as, a, as something that spans categories because if someone wanted to see everything that was chocolate they could look in that in the tag screen and then all chocolate products would show up if they looked in the cakes category then obviously the chocolate cookies would never show up and the chocolate mousse pie would never show up so if a person wants to see everything of chocolate We've got it tagged. We've got everything tagged with chocolate, and therefore they can see it. And how about your Twitter ad tag? Everything related to that is going to come up. It's a way to organize across categories, and so it's just another way for people to find what they're looking for. But it won't be just tagged. It'll be chocolate with the tag. Yes, I'm just saying that the okay, thing so that it's called. Okay, reminding us that we're going to put a tag on this right? Okay. Yeah. So the tag will will be I shouldn't note it will be chocolate. Okay. 
So these all share the same tag, chocolate. There's a category called pie, there's a category called cookies, and a category called cakes. And then there's a tag called chocolate. And that chocolate tag is applied to everything that is chocolate. Obviously, it doesn't happen automatically. We do it, but it's not complicated. Once everything is properly tagged and categorized, then the users will be able to find our products easier. And then also the search engines. You know, this is a little bit of SEO, search engine optimization. If the, if the search engines like Google and Bing see that your site is properly set up, well organized, everything's findable, it will have your site show up perhaps a little higher than your competitors that doesn't have that organization because the search engines care about finding the right content to, for the right search. And if you organize, that helps. All right, so what we're going to do is apply this. It takes a little bit of setup, but it's not complicated. Uh, we'll, we'll do this right now, but let's take our last break, a shorter one this time. When we come back then, we'll actually do this. We'll see it's not that complicated except for variations. That's a little complicated, but we'll do it together. So let's just take a five-ish minute, five -ish minute break. We'll be back at 8.20, and um, we'll do this. Is it a mandatory break? No. <laughs>